just had. I need to get the script. Oh, you know, we'll do that. I assume that's better. We're being live webcast, so we're going to begin in one minute for the team in the back there. Sanger. It's Joe Pilot from Los Alamos National Laboratory. How are you? Good to see you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak. I'd like to welcome you to today's um, meeting at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's a conversation with David Sanger about his new book. The Inheritance, The World Obama Confronts and the Challenges to American Power. Uh, today's meeting is co-sponsored uh, with the Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, an institution with which the Wilson Center sponsors a monthly series of meetings on topical nonproliferation issues. We're delighted that Dr. Joseph Pilot of the Los Alamos National Laboratory can be with us today, today representing his institution. Uh, within the Wilson Center, uh, this meeting is also co-sponsored with the Middle East program, uh, whose director, Hales Fandiari, is here today, and the Asia program, headed by uh, Robert Hathaway. And uh, we're, we're grateful for uh, the assistance of our co-sponsors in putting today's meeting together. Um, this book is a must-read uh, for anyone interested in U.S. foreign policy. It's been on the New York Times bestsellers list. Uh, it... Uh, is not only a history, but is also broken news. Uh, we are delighted to welcome back David Sanger, uh, who is the chief Washington correspondent for the New York Times. He's had a 26-year career at the Times. Uh, he's been a member of two teams that won Pulitzer Prizes. He's received numerous awards for investigative national security and White House reporting. Uh, we're very pleased uh, at the center that David uh, spent part of his leave from the, the Times here in residence as a public policy scholar. For those of us on the staff, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to have uh, the range of different professions and expertise come through here as, as residential fellows, and uh, the journalists make a tremendous contribution, so we're, it, was, it was marvelous for us to have David here. Uh, so David, welcome back, and congratulations on making the Times bestsellers list. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank all of you who made my um, stay here at the Wilson Center um, so pleasant. It's a, really, it's a great place to get uh, a project like this done. And um, I can tell you that it had it not been, uh, Rob, for, for you and everybody else at the center who uh, made, uh, made the space and the time and the editing and companionship available, the book would not have gotten gotten written, and it, it did do a land speed record because the last elements of the last chapters of this left the fifth floor of this building on the second week of December, and it was in the bookstores the second week of January. So good. <laughs> well, the format of today's meetings is somewhat of a departure from the typical meetings today. We're we're doing this, conducting this as a, as a conversation rather than uh, you at the podium with uh, high tech PowerPoint or whatever. Um, uh, the uh, s the unfolding scenario for today is that we're going. To, I'm going to have a conversation with David about his book for about a half an hour. Then we're going to open it up for comments and questions from the floor. Uh, around one o'clock, where we will adjourn to the boardroom, uh, where there's a, a standing uh, kind of lunch and reception, and also books uh, available for purchase and signing by the authors available at popular price. Uh, thanks to our vendor writers, which is covering today's event. David, let's kick off uh, just with the, the, uh, the broadest and uh, you know, question to sort of get the conversation going. Take us through the central arguments of the book. Well, you know, I, I covered the Bush White House from its first days. Uh, I've been White House correspondent in the last, uh, last year of the Clinton administration um, through to the um, to end of 2007. And in that period of time, I really wanted to... Um, sort of come to grips with what I thought were some of the central questions that came out of his presidency that were not actually about Iraq, but rather mm -hmm. what happened in the rest of the world while we distracted ourselves in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So this is the non-Iraq book. There are lots of great Iraq books out there, and I can 
commend um, several to you uh, by my colleagues, and there are several more that are um, being written. But this is the book about what the long-term opportunity cost of Iraq was. And when I say that Iraq was a distraction, I don't mean by that that it was the right war or the wrong war or the right war badly executed, and we could spend the rest of the day arguing um, that point. But instead, that it so occupied the minds of the central leadership of the United States that we managed to ignore much bigger threats that emerged during that time and that the president couldn't talk about because of the intelligence lapses in Iraq that so undercut his credibility. And we also ignored huge opportunities that had emerged uh, throughout the rest of the Bush presidency that he couldn't exploit because we just didn't have the bandwidth within the U.S. government to go deal with them. So in the first category, I mean, obviously, Afghanistan is at the top of the list as a, a place where we literally picked up our military and intelligence resources and moved them to Iraq, uh, having convinced ourselves that the Taliban were gone. And I think you know one of the one of the most interesting just repertorial elements that I would send you to in the inheritance is that while we had a White House that was arguing that they never bled Afghanistan in order to feed the beast in Iraq, on the record in this book is every American ambassador uh, to Afghanistan, every senior U.S. military commander, and a number of the CIA and other intelligence officers describing just how those resources were moved. But it didn't stop there. Um, The Iranian nuclear program was something that President Bush couldn't fully confront because he couldn't discuss it publicly and because uh, the Iranians knew that we had 140,000 people tied up in Iraq that were within their reach. The North Korean nuclear program, the North Koreans harvested the fuel for their weapons in January, February, and March of 2003. When I went over this timing last summer with a senior member of the Bush administration who was talking for the book, he said to me, remind me of those dates again, David? And I said to him, and he said, yeah, we were a little busy then, which was kind of the point. Um, And then in cases like China, we had enormous opportunities, which President Obama says he's going to try to exploit now, to um, work with them on energy, environment, Obviously, uh, they are now uh, the fastest-growing emitter of uh, carbon-based pollutions. They're also the fastest-growing consumer of fuels. Yet we never got a significant conversation underway with them uh, at that at that time period. Mm-hmm. And so the book is an examination of the opportunity costs and thus the inheritance left to Obama in that regard. Thank you for that overview. Let's bore in on uh, uh, the, one of the most topical cases, uh, Iran. Um, a diplomat from the region, when asked you know, who won the Iraq war, to topple Saddam Hussein, said the answer was Iran. Um, I think uh, during the presidential campaign, both candidates agreed it was at the top tier of U.S. national security challenges. Uh, you broke news in the, in, in, uh, in the, pa- in the Times. Uh, with revelation about covert operations, um, about uh, uh, an Israeli approach to the Bush administration uh, to discuss uh, a military option. Let's turn to that, but, but set it up by looking back to, you know, you, this link the opportunity cost theme with the current challenge theme. Going back to 2003, the toppling of Saddam Hussein, you know, one doesn't need to be kind of Thucydides or Henry Kissinger to figure out that if you have taken down the Taliban to the east and Saddam Hussein to the west, that there might be a geostrategic opening for doing business in Tehran. Do you, you know, concur that there was an opportunity there that could have been exploited by, by the Bush administration to cap the nuclear program at an earlier, earlier point? There was an opportunity there to explore what the Iranians were willing to do and were not willing to do. Whether, given how opaque the Iranian leadership is, uh, whether that opportunity would have turned in anything is anybody's guess. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's sort of hard to tell right now. And uh, my guess is uh, that it would have been difficult, but we had an opportunity. 
Um, and the opportunity came the very week of the mission accomplished speech. Uh, because that was the week that this fax appears magically at the State Department from the Swiss who are uh, running our interest section uh, in Tehran uh, with an offer that may or may not have been serious, uh, but that as I traced it back, I discovered that uh, Colin Powell never brought to President Bush, and he didn't bring it to President Bush because he knew the mood of the White House right at that time. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of the, the max, if you were charting the maximum period of sort of hubris in the Bush White House, that would have been the months. Because remember what the theory of the Iraq War was. The theory was, and this was explicitly stated in a number of the meetings that are reconstructed in the book, theory was that we would topple Saddam Hussein so quickly that Iran and North Korea and countries like it would basically call up to Washington and ask if we had a P.O. box where they could begin to mail their nuclear weapons and the equipment to go build them. Um, That phone call didn't come, but the fact that Libya did disarm uh, actually fed the theory that it would happen, even if Libya was operating for its own reasons that I won't uh, won't trouble you with right now, but we can come back to. So instead, the theory was that whatever offer the Iranians made would improve dramatically over the next couple of years as Iraq turned into this blooming democracy. And there was never really serious discussion that I could find that if in fact the opposite happened, if Iraq turned into a morass, that the reverse effect would take hold Mm -hmm. and that countries would either dig in or decide they had to speed ahead with their nuclear weapons programs, which of course is what Iran and what North Korea both did. Um, So let's fast forward to... um, 2005, 2006, uh, we wrote in the Times uh, a good deal about the Iranian program. Uh, We wrote about uh, the people who were putting the thing together, the evidence that the IEA had come together with, and um, the great laptop of death, as it is referred to um, somewhat facetiously, which is the laptop computer Mm -hmm. that had a lot of the designs of these... um, uh, of these uh, nucle- on the nuclear weapon side um, uh, in them. The laptop made it out of Iran. The scientist who put the material on it, unfortunately, never did make it out of Iran. His family did. And so as these revelations came out, we began asking people at the White House. I asked the president at one point at the end of 2005, this evidence is much more solid, much more detailed than anything that you had on Saddam Hussein. Why are you not discussing it publicly? Mm -hmm. And President Bush said to me, you know, David, I I can't do that in public. I can do it with the allies. I can do it in private. But after what happened in Iraq, I don't think we can step out and once again uh, talk about allegations of a country putting together Mm -hmm. uh, nuclear facilities. Well, this was a pretty remarkable admission when you think about it, because just because Iraq didn't have a program doesn't mean no other country in the world does. And yet we had a president of the United States who was fundamentally admitting that their credibility had been so blown that they couldn't get out and do this. Um, The Iranian program, or at least the uranium enrichment part of the program, sped ahead. At the end of 2003, perhaps out of concern of getting caught, perhaps because of the international pressure, there were orders that were put out within the Iranian hierarchy to stop the weapons development. And that happened because the U.S. pierced the computer networks inside the team that works for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that was working on the program. And that's described uh, with some care uh, to leave out some details that would uh, be overly helpful to the Iranians uh, that's described in the book. Then in um, just about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, the Israelis came to the White House secretly and asked for the bunker-busting weapons, the refueling capability, and overflight rights over Iraq that they would need to strike Natanz. And here something remarkable happened. The President of the United States would raise preemption to the level of a doctrine, 
said to the Israelis he would not help them preempt. And he said it because he was afraid that if they overflew Iraq, we would be uh, invited to have all of our troops leave immediately. He feared a broader war in the Middle East. He already had one or two underway. Uh, and um, finally... Do, do, you, do you think that was a serious plan, or was it more just a way of ratcheting up pressure on the Bush administration to in turn sort of increase pressure on allies to do more to take the military option off the table? Rob, I think it was both. Yeah. I think that the Israelis had felt promised by the Bush administration or by President Bush himself that he would take care of the nuclear problem before he left office. And I think they were fearful by the beginning of 2008 that he would leave office without the problem resolved. Mm -hmm. And I think the way they thought that they could both force their hand and develop the ability to go do it themselves if they needed to was to make this request. And I think they were a little surprised. It was pretty mm -hmm. tense. Um, they believed that their strike could set back the Iranian nuclear program by two to three years. The American assessment was that it could set it back by six months to a year. Mm. And so the argument inside the White House was, it's not worth it. Uh, and then President Bush said to uh, the Israelis, you know, you've got to give my covert program time because we've greatly expanded a covert program to undermine the, the uh, Natan's plant. And again, this is described with some care. Uh, leaving out, as we said uh, in the Times story about this, some details that the intelligence community um, felt would harm ongoing operations. But I thought it was important to lay this story out because while it's easy to get out and say that we're either going to engage Iran or not, something that President Obama has discussed at great length, um, the real issue is do you, engage Obama, uh, do you engage the Iranians and does President Obama engage the Ir Iranians while he still has this program that he has inherited from President Bush underway, mm -hmm. or does he call a stop to it? Uh, the Iran case, um, and there's some marvelous reporting in this book, uh, not all of much of which did not appear in the paper, on internal IAEA deliberations, a, a marvelous uh, kind of account of the showdown uh, by IAEA officials with the Iranian delegation <laughs> in, in Vienna in uh, uh, early uh, 08, I guess it was, and also uh, the deliberations within the, within the administration leading to the controversial 2003, 2007 National Intelligence Estimate on Iran, which uh, the public rollout of which and, and, the, and the, uh, the criticism that the CIA had buried the lead by saying that the weaponization piece that you referred to had stopped uh, in 2003, but that Iran was in, had made significant progress on the fuel cycle aspects that the uranium enrichment, um, which uh, National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley called the short pole, the long pole in the tent, mm -hmm. that the lead kind of indicator there. That that um, history is, is sort of laid out here. But at the core is this internal war that you referred to in the administration, and uh, this unresolved tension in the policy of, uh, that the decider never decided whether the U.S. objective was to change the regime in Tehran or to change the behavior uh, or it's the conduct of the regime there. And one sees that played out in the Iran case, but also in the case I'd like to now turn to um, North Korea, uh, which um, uh, you refer to as the nuclear, the chapter's titled The Nuclear Renegade That Got Away. I'd like you to sort of flesh out kind of what that, right. that, that title means, but also um, in particular, focus on this crucial period of 2002 through 2003, where in response to your query about Iran and the officials said, we had something else on our minds, uh, right. something else on our plate in t during that time period. It seems that, that, that during that same time period, uh, the ball was taken off of uh, the plutonium program in North Korea. And, and just the final piece of the setup to, to let you kind of uh, flesh out uh, um, the uh, findings of that chapter. One has, with Secretary of State Clinton in Japan, uh, s striking criticism of the Bush administration's handling of the North Korean case and the uh, collapse of the, uh, the agreed framework um, that had been negotiated in the 1990s. But tell it, flesh that one out. And, and, and well, what you know, you North Korea was a remarkable case. It's something I had been following for a long time because I used to be Tokyo bureau chief and, and spent some time in North mm -hmm. Korea at that time. Um, and so in 2003, 
early 2003, as we were headed to Iraq, uh, the North Koreans threw out the international inspectors, having been confronted with American allegations about uh, a second secret pathway to the bomb that they appeared to be taking. Uh, nobody in the Bush administration had done that question. It's always the most important question to ask in government, which is, and then what? You know, we say something to the North Koreans, try to anticipate how they how they would react. We had no plan B. They threw out the inspectors. They began harvesting this fuel that had been under inspection for many years and turning it into what they now claim are full weapons. I started writing front page stories about how this activity was being picked up by American satellites. And the call started coming from the Bush administration, from the White House, saying, you know, David, you're on the wrong story. The nuclear threat you need to worry about is Saddam Hussein, because this was the months just before. And President Bush was out talking about Saddam Hussein three, four, five times a week, but barely mentioning the fact that this fuel, whose an exact size and numbers we knew well was being shipped off for production. And their central argument was that Saddam Hussein lived in a worse neighborhood. And therefore, this, the potential that he could get a weapon was a more severe problem than the likelihood that North Korea, which may have already had one or two weapons, could get six or seven or eight more. Now, I found this a thin argument at the time, um, but I really found it a thin argument as I went back through the book mm -hmm. because, of course, we all know what happened with uh, Iraq. And then in the case of North Korea, they spent the next five years trying to get back the then weaponized fuel that had disappeared over a period of weeks. And I tell the story in here of how Richard Myers, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had gone into President Bush and described to him the plan that they'd long had on the table in the Pentagon to be able to take out just these North Korean facilities, which are well segregated from any uh, civilian population, uh, although there would obviously be some risk of uh, nuclear contamination. Um, but this was considered inside the Oval Office for about under three minutes because the only question was, how are our forces moving into Kuwait and on into Iraq? Um, this became, over time, I think, probably the single biggest casualty of the Iraq War mm -hmm. because not only did North Korea get the weaponry, and I think the chances we're going to get it back are fairly slim, but because North Korea became a proliferator in and of its own right. The North Korea chapters open with the Israeli bombing of the Syrian reactor in September of, of um, 2007. And that reactor was built with North Korean help. The Bush administration had not known of what was going on until the head of the Mossad came into Steve Hadley's office uh, scene also described in, in the book, mm -hmm. and dropped a file full of photographs uh, on his coffee table that showed what the North Koreans were helping build and even showed the head of, the, of, of construction at the Yongbyon plant in North Korea uh, enjoying the sunshine in Syria with a Syrian car behind them and so forth. Some of the photographs from that file are, by the way, reproduced in the photo section uh, of the book. Um, just in case there's, there's any continuing doubt. Um, that was the real North Korea threat. They lived in the fantasy in 2001, 2002, 2003 that the North Koreans were so on the edge that they could push them over the edge. Um, and then by the second term, it became clear that that wasn't going to happen. But they never really resolved this dispute, Rob, because... Um, I think Vice President Cheney and many of his uh, allies still harbored the belief that you could crush the North Koreans. I think Secretary Rice and others came to the conclusion, no, we have to negotiate with them. And the subterfuges that Secretary Rice had to go through to get those negotiations going on, you know, to authorize them in direct phone calls back to President Bush so that Vice President Cheney would only hear about it after the fact, were pretty remarkable stories. 
the, um, the Bush administrations, two administ the two administrations of the Bush, of the Bush era, are, you know, in some respects, strikingly different. In they the second, are. in the second administration, and we had your colleague uh, Elizabeth Bumiller here wrote a book about Condoleezza Rice, which talked about this sort of these uh, tale of these two administrations. You had to turn to diplomacy, um, and but was hamstrung by the legacies of the first administration, where you had this core unresolved contradiction on the regime change and the behavior change, and there was a sense that, so what you're, you're arguing is that the, this unresolved tension sort of led to these opportunity costs, uh, an Iranian program that might have been addressed at an earlier stage that was, that was uh, and we don't know whether anything would have come to fruition from that, but that was deferred. Um, and in the case of North Korea, there was a sense that the regime was teetering and on, on, on the brink of collapse. And if we could enlist the Chinese to just squeeze them, we might, might push them over the edge. So the, the Which showed yeah. a lack of understanding of the Chinese yeah. motivations, because mm -hmm. the Chinese may not want a nuclear North Korea, but what they didn't, really didn't want was right. a collapsed regime right next door to them. You know, the second term wasn't all bad, Rob. I mean, they sort of got a lot of things going that you're seeing President Obama pick up. The six-party talks, I say, you know, were a great innovation that I was initially quite skeptical about, but I think mm -hmm. is a pretty good structure for going forward in Asia. Um, the problem is that they had dug a hole so deep in the first term that come the second term, they sort of couldn't climb out of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you you see some vi quite vivid language from Chris Hill, the American uh, negotiator with North Korea, who, um, I'll be delicate with this because he used phraseology that one wouldn't normally use in a, in a nice Wilson Center foreign policy seminar, but he said, you know, these blankety blanks don't know how to negotiate. And when he came in, mm -hmm. he was shocked. I mean, he, had, was given he was given instructions that included these. You will not shake hands with the North Koreans. You will not break bread with the North Koreans. You know, you will barely acknowledge, you know, you will not meet them separately. And he went about systematically in the second term violating every one of the rules with great pleasure um, that he had, that had been set mm -hmm. for him. And in the end, as described in the book, they moved President Bush like five degrees at a time in hopes that in a year or two he wouldn't recognize that his policy had been moved 180 degrees. That's, um, I really, um, uh, you would put Iran and North Korea at the top of the non-proliferation agenda for the Obama administration, but they're really there. There is this legacy of, of, of that they are inheriting, and uh, one wonders whether. Uh, non-proliferation is actually a realistic objective in dealing with these with these two countries. Uh, you write uh, that the North Cor that the Iranians. What's, what's the phrase is uh, the, um, the the Iranians have thrived on nuclear ambiguity. Um, the North Koreans have had this one chip that they keep playing. The weak hand, the, the nuclear card, they keep playing it over and over again. Um, they actually. In, uh, went ahead and detonated in 2000, autumn 2006 uh, and said they'd weaponized these. But they've also said that those weapons are on the table potentially for, 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 for a deal. But do you, um, for the Obama administration, you know, how do you judge the practical possibilities of making headway on either of these two hard cases? In the North Korea case, I think that you could put on the table the possibility of stopping all future production. I would highly doubt the North Koreans are going to give up what they've already produced mm -hmm. because, as you say, it is their only chip. And without nuclear weapons, North Korea is the Senegal of Asia, which is to say that they will get remembered in American foreign policy on World Food Day and a few other days. But uh, they fundamentally would not be significantly mm -hmm. on the agenda. And they know it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the chances that they're going to give this up are pretty slim pretty small. In the case of Iran, it's much more complex. They have been very savvy about nuclear ambiguity, and I'm not at all persuaded that they actually want to go ahead and build a full weapon, because for their objectives, they may not need a full weapon. All they need is the Japan option. They need a good-sized store of nuclear material. 
the knowledge that they have, the engineers and the engineering capability to produce a weapon at any time. The suspicion that A.Q. Khan, the, the man who helped arm Iran and North Korea and Libya, sold them the weapons designs. And there are parts of the books that will describe how there are three complete weapons designs or near complete weapons designs that have been found on the computer systems of members of the Khan network. Uh, two of which seem very Pakistani in, in nature. Mm -hmm. We don't know if the Iranians have one of those, but there's a good reason to guess that they may. And so the Iranians may simply be trying to get to the point where they can say, we can build a bomb in a matter of months if we don't like the way things are going. Mm -hmm. And that may be a useful ambiguity because it may stop the rest of the Arab states from building immediately as well. One member of the Bush administration said to me at the end of President Bush's last trip to the Middle East, he came back and he said, you know, David, there are a lot of people here in America who are afraid that we're going to bomb the Iranians before we leave office. And he said, and there are a lot of people out in the Gulf who are afraid we're not. And yeah. while it sounded harsh, there's a fair bit of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Let's move uh, final sort of uh, line of questioning about uh, these connected vessels, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and here, um, your book could not be more timely amidst developments such as the release of A.Q. Khan from house arrest, the Taliban, Pakistan truce. By the way, it wasn't the tightest house arrest, and I went by the house a few times <laughs> when I was in Pakistan. If you have to go through house arrest, you want to do it in that house, trust me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I should mention, uh, you know, that, that David has been personally denounced by Pres former President Musharraf for his book, uh, which he's described as BS with double cherries on top. And uh, maybe that's a pull quote for the next uh, edition. Good of, for the paperback book, edition. The paperback yeah. edition. Yeah. But we have the, re the release of AQ Khan, the Taliban Pakistan truce in the North Frontier pro um, pro province, uh, 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 in tandem with the imposition of Islamic law there. Um, uh, you have attacks on on the roads leading into Pakistan, from Pakistan into Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, in the United States, uh, the new foreign policy team has designated Richard Holbrook as um, significantly, he's, he's, a, he's a special envoy for Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's not that, 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 they, that the administration under, you know, fully appreciates how these two issues are, they are connected vessels. And your book, I think, taking us through the, the history of Afghanistan uh, the um, uh, the war, the never finished war, um, and then segueing into your discussion of Pakistan, I think really um, elucidates that. So, give us some um, kind of the high, the, uh, the in this narrative of uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the major sort of uh, findings from the book. Well, one of the major findings uh, was put to me very well by a member of the Joint Chiefs, who said, "You know, David." you can't win in Afghanistan unless you solve the sanctuary in Pakistan. But if you solve the sanctuary in Pakistan, that's no guarantee we're going to win in Afghanistan. So it's the first order of business, mm -hmm. not only because al-Qaeda is there, not only because the sort of big T Taliban are there who have been moving into Afghanistan, but also because we are equally or more worried now about the small T Taliban who are uh, aiming at the Pakistani government itself, which is why I devote so much space in the book to the security of Pakistan's 100 nuclear weapons, because in the end, that's why we care the most about what happens to Pakistan. Um, the Pakistanis let me into a bit of that program to persuade me that um, the weapons are well secured. I think they are well secured, uh, but there are a couple of telling uh, gaps and elements that we don't know. First, the United States government has spent over the past six or seven years about $100 million on a not-so-secret uh, program to help improve Pakistani nuclear security. But whenever we've tried to audit that program, we can't figure out quite how the money's been spent because the Pakistanis don't want to let us know where their weapons are located. Why not? Because while they are routinely referred to or were in the Bush time as um, great allies of the United States, they fear that we've got some um, SEAL team hanging just offshore ready to swoop in and grab their nuclear weapons at any moment uh, when we are nervous that their government could collapse. 
and that's probably a pretty well-founded fear. Um, the, um, the second uh, reason that I'm concerned is that the big black hole in Pakistan is the are the nuclear laboratories themselves, the places that AQ Khan built up. And uh, those are of particular concern because, as the book reveals, um, U.S. intelligence believes that uh, Pakistanis who are being trained in the sciences in Europe, some of them are being recruited to see if they have fundamentalist sympathies so that when they go back to Pakistan, they can be put inside the Pakistani program. And the people who run the security for the program tell me that they do a lot to try to filter out the beliefs uh, of uh, those who they hire, they watch bank accounts, they do all those things that we do within our own intelligence agencies. But as many have pointed out to me, occasionally we have spectacular failures even in our own program here uh, along those lines. Um, and when you think that there are about 2,000 Pakistanis with critical knowledge of how the nuclear program works, if you had just two or three percent of those who had strong sympathies with one of the insurgent groups, you've got a significant sized problem. Um, the part that set President Musharraf off about the book was the conclusion that American intelligence reached that while Pakistan was a great ally, it was an ally mostly on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they had a committee that got together to figure out how to support the Taliban. Uh, and this became clear to Mike McConnell, who just left as director of national intelligence, on one of the many secret trips that uh, he and the CIA director took uh, to Pakistan last year after Benazir Bhutto's killing, uh, in which um, uh, he was witness to a conversation held clearly for his benefit uh, by two Pakistani generals who talked quite openly about why they had to support the Taliban. And the reason they said was simple that the United States was going to get tired of being in Afghanistan, it was going to pull out, and when it pulled out, India would move even further into southern Afghanistan and surround and crush uh, Pakistan. Uh, when President Karzai was here on this stage a few, uh, a few months ago, he even referred at one point to that concern. He didn't sound as worried about it as the Pakistanis do, but he knows that that's an issue of sensitivity for them. So. Um, that is the core problem with Pakistan. They are an ally who we have to conduct military operations on their territories if we want to crush al-Qaeda and these um, other insurgents. And we have failed utterly in our development programs mm -hmm. uh, in Pakistan. Uh, the book describes the secret orders that President Bush signed last July authorizing American ground action over the border. And while I can't predict much with much certainty about the Obama foreign policy, I think one thing that is pretty safe to say is that that program will continue mm -hmm. under President Obama. Great. Let's uh, open it up now for comments and, and we'll preferably questions from the floor. We have microphones on either side. Uh, uh, please indicate if you uh, like to ask a question and also uh, please identify yourself. Yeah. Oliver, there's a question there. Then. Hi, I'm Jeff, Jeff Abramson with the Arms Control Association. Thank you very much for the talk. A uh, question about how the inheritance might be for allies who could be helpers. You talked a little bit about the six party talks and about China. Where do you think Obama administration picks up on any ally building or returning to get allies back that could help out these problems That's a very good question. I, I wrote about this a little bit in the Week in Review this past week, and the question was, what's the value of the Obama factor? Is he going to be able, by f dint of his popularity, his personality, and his evident interest in putting together new alliances or rebuilding old ones, to bring allies together? And I think in some cases he will, particularly in Asia, and I think you see Secretary Clinton working away on that right now. The hard part's going to be Europe. You remember last summer, then-candidate Obama shows up in Berlin. There are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people out cheering for him. If the election was held in Europe, he would have won 98% <laughs> to two. 
maybe higher. Um, then comes next April, this, this coming April, when he shows up in Europe for the NATO summit. And what's going to happen at that? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that he is going uh, to be pressing them for more troops for um, Afghanistan, of which he announced yesterday we're adding 17,000. Already he's done something that I think is very smart. He's gone out to each of the allies who are in Afghanistan now and asked them basically to fill out a questionnaire and send in a report and recommendations about what they think needs to be done in Afghanistan. And the purpose of this is highly transparent because he's going to turn this around in April as each one of them knows and says, I looked at your report, you persuaded me. The situation over there is really, really bad. So here's what we're contributing to turning it around. What are you contributing mm -hmm. at the very moment that the Europeans want to be leaving there? And I think that's going to be a point of great tension. And that will be the real test of what he can rebuild. Bob Hathaway. Bob Hathaway at the Wilson Center. Uh, nice to have you back, David. Thank you. Uh, I, my question um, stems from your comment about Chris Hill moving President Bush on North Korea policy five degrees at a time. Uh, what's your take overall on George Bush? Um, was he simply uh, manipulated by people who were more clever than he, as that five degrees at a time might s indicate? Um, was he, in fact, uh, the decider, uh, as he claimed to be? Uh, we've got others here, like Jim Mann, who have written on the president. Um, is your understanding of President Bush in any sub significant way different from the portrait that we've been given by others? Perhaps a little. I didn't mean by that story to indicate that he had been manipulated as much as um, that he was enormously stubborn. <coughs> So having set himself on a pathway in the first term, it was clear to all of those who knew him that you weren't going to get him to stand up and say, you know, we've tried this for four years and it hasn't worked. It's time to reverse policy. Some argued for that. Nick Burns, another graduate of the Wilson Center here, uh, in fact, we overlapped some in our time, is quoted in the book as saying that he argued that in the case of Iran, that we drop the preconditions and go ahead and have negotiations with them because they were building centrifuges anyway while we were sitting there on the principle of we wouldn't talk uh, while, they were, while they were producing centrifuges. Um, that was a non-starter. It never made it as far as President Bush because people who worked around him knew that he was not going to do a 180 degree turn. So instead they moved the ship gradually on the theory, you know, this was the oil tanker theory, that, you know, you move it a little bit at a time, and eventually, on North Korea and to a lesser degree on Iran, they were pointed in very different directions than they had been at the end of the first term. If you asked him, did he change policy, he'd say, no, of course not. If you asked him, as circumstances changed, did you adjust, he would have said, of course we did. Now, you and I could sit here and probably have a different interpretation of those events. Mm -hmm. um, some would argue he didn't turn far enough. Uh, and I certainly think that in terms of engagement, that you know, where you're seeing the Obama administration head, they've got some real hard liners on Iran, for example, in the Obama administration. But I think that there is a commitment that they have to fully play out the possibility of negotiating with the Iranians. Because one of the lessons of Iraq is you'll never bring your allies with you on sanctions or a confrontation or whatever it came to if you can't demonstrate that you seriously tried to find a negotiated solution. And that, like uh, Libya, you're willing to take yes for an answer by That's taking right. the regime change objective off the table. And uh, you, you wrote just in the last week or so about uh, in, in surveying the different perspectives on Iran and the administration, uh, an emerging, uh, you know, uh, uh, line, uh, kind of bumper sticker, you know, stronger carrots, better carrots, better sticks. Yep. 
and uh, that that seems to be where they're going to be playing it out in the coming months. And see that's right, because you know, in the Bush years, the forces that did not want to engage with Iran prevented the administration from having them sit down and lay out what a grand bargain could look like, what benefits could come to Iran. And instead, they engaged in all of this, you know, sort of secret backdoor, you know, conversations. My own view, and I'd be interested to hear because there are many people in this audience who know a lot more about Iran than I do, um, is that when you do get to that grand bargain part, you have to do it completely in public so that you separate out young Iranians, the overwhelming majority, who want good relations with the U.S. and make them ask their own leadership, you're turning down what? Are, are my visas in that package? Well, some have argued that we should try to, the United States should try to position the upcoming June elections in Iran as sort of a referendum, essentially, teed up on that question about relations with the United States, which is a defining issue in Iran in a way that Iran is not a defining issue in the United States. That's yeah, right. So, a uh, question all the way in the back. Uh, Mr. Sanger. You've got a microphone coming to you. Use yeah. on the inheritance in this hemisphere, particularly. Just identify in, yourself. In, in yes, my name is Mark Brzezinski with McGuire Woods Law Firm. Yeah. Um, the inheritance in this hemisphere, particularly focusing on Mexico, but also Latin America generally, because you may recall the Bush administration started back in 2001 with a special interest in Mexico and the election of Vincente Fox. And the Calderon government seems to, to be having uh, trouble, at a, to, to say the least. You can see in the newspaper stories every day about kind of these narco traffickers really challenging the Mexican military um, and uh, kind of counter narcotics um, efforts there. Could you say a little bit more about the inheritance in this hemisphere, particularly? Mexico? Sure. Um, you know, the great irony, Mark, and you, you pointed this out just right, is that. The one area of foreign policy that President Bush came into office promising to go pay attention to because it had been neglected for so long is the one that he ended up neglecting the most. And you'll remember uh, that he had reached, uh, had a ceremony with, uh, with President Fox on the South Lawn. I was there, what, two days, three days before 9-11, where he was on his way for what I thought was a pretty innovative and fairly politically courageous solution to the guest worker problem. And he couldn't bring his own party along uh, with that. But after 9-11, basically all that got dropped. And uh, then, of course, in Venezuela, they briefly you know, backed the loser in, in, in the great competition. And um, over time, I think that you know, the big lesson of, uh, for Latin America was that it suffered enormous neglect under President Bush. He would travel there, but you could see his spirit was not in it. And you saw this whenever he was doing foreign policy in general. I, you know, one of the, the, the benefits and hazards of being White House correspondent is you travel with the president all the time. And when he was discussing counterterrorism, even in Latin America, he was highly animated. And thus, he could stay animated for a while on the narco-terrorism part of this because it had the word terrorism in it, even if it wasn't related to the forces of 9-11. But when you got to the rest of the relationship that most of Latin America was interested in, uh, including a hemispheric trade deal, which was being discussed actively at the end of Clinton's time, uh, they lost complete interest in that. And then the immigration crackdown that followed from 9-11, I think, set the relationships back considerably, especially with Mexico. Take one more question. Howard? I'm Howard Wiarda from CSIS and the Wilson Center as well. Uh, I wanted to expand on Mark's question a little bit because the, the focus with Rob so far has largely been on the dramatic cases. Uh, Iraq and Iran and uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and North Korea. I wonder if, you, if you'd make the case, or if you do in the book, since I haven't even seen the table of contents yet, that uh, other areas, let's say East Asia or South Asia or Russia or Latin America or the broader Middle East, may have uh, even more important implications in long-range terms than do these very dramatic <laughs> 
cases that grab the headlines uh, so often. So I'm curious if your book is a real tour de force of, of neglect in other areas as well, or if the main focus is really these dramatic uh, cases. A very good, very good question. Um, at the opening, I said that there were both rising threats we never confronted and rising opportunities we never exploited. And uh, my case study for the rising opportunities we never exploited uh, is largely China, uh, because um, the Chinese couldn't believe their luck here. Remember, this, the Bush administration had come in, as, as Mark said, talking about expanding relationships with Latin America. You'll also remember they came in talking about finding a way to contain Chinese power. And there was a huge amount of literature that the neoconservatives had turned out on this uh, issue. Uh, and if you go into Jim Mann's um, book on the Vulcans, you'll see this at, you know, at great length. Um, then what happens? We make the decision to invade Iraq. The neoconservatives are distracted by the great cause of getting rid of Saddam Hussein. Then they're bogged down in making the Iraq war happen. We need China on North Korea. And suddenly, the Chinese realize that they have hit the jackpot out here. And they use the moment. They use the moment to expand their relations throughout Latin America and Africa, where they signed up exclusive oil deals. These are deals I don't think are going to work out for them as well as they had intended, but they signed them up. They built new capitals in East Asia, including in East Timor. You go through the capital in East Timor. It's, it's remarkable, and it's all built with Chinese money. It's the kind of thing we used to do in Latin America and in Europe in the 50s and 60s when we were trying to contain communism. They were trying to contain American influence. And you could almost hear, you know, you could almost play out in your mind the conversation that I'm sure never happened between Hu Jintao and President Bush with Hu Jintao saying, you know, Mr. President, this goal of democratizing the Middle East, it's a fabulous idea. And I can't think of anybody better suited to do it than you guys. I think you ought to devote the next 10, 15 years to this. And would you send us a postcard and let us know how it's going and if there's anything we can do to help? Because, you know, 15 years out, if you look at their charts, that's about when their economic size crosses with ours. Uh, and when their military uh, uh, as well, their military power um, begins to expand considerably. So I spend a fair bit of time trying to look at the question of how well we did with what I think was our most potent weapon. I use China as the example, but it applies equally in Latin America and, and many other parts of the world. I spend some time inside Lenovo, the company that makes um, what used to be the IBM um, ThinkPad computer, uh, and they bought out the entire IBM ThinkPad division. And I argue in the book, essentially, that this kind of purchase, while reviled on Capitol Hill as selling out American industry, is actually the best way to integrate in a generation of young Chinese. Because when I went to go interview the people who were working on designing these computers, their only interest in the Chinese government was making sure it stayed out of their way. You know, they were traveling around the world. They were going to conferences in Japan and the U.S. They were designing their computers. And they basically had no guidance from the government. Now, many industries in China are not like that. And fewer will be in the coming months as the economic crisis settles in even worse. But that's the China we want to encourage. And that's also, in many ways, what we want to encourage in other parts of the world. Thank you, David. Before we adjourn to the boardroom uh, for the reception, let me mention three upcoming events, um, all of which will be held in the fifth floor conference room from noon to 1.30. This Friday, February 20th, uh, Charles Dolfer, the former head of the Iraq Survey Group, will be here uh, presenting uh, his new book, uh, hide and seek, an account of the Iraq inspections leading up to the war, um, and then the aftermath when he was the inspector uh, um, searching for WMD. That's, that's this coming Friday. Uh, on Monday, February 23rd, a former uh, criminal investigator of the U.S. Air Force, Matthew Arnold, uh, will discuss his book, How to Break a Terrorist, 
uh, the U.S. interrogators who use brains, not brutality, to take down the deadliest man in Iraq. And then on Friday, February 27th, uh, Stephen Younger, formerly of Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, who de designed, helped design uh, nuclear weapons uh, in part of his career, uh, has a new book out, The Bomb, colon, A New History. So uh, those are upcoming events that may be of interest to those in the audience today. Uh, with that, we're going to adjourn to the boardroom for a reception, but it remains um, simply for me to ask you to join me in thanking David Sanger for an excellent <laughs> overview of his book today. There's a, a reception uh, and uh, books available for purchase and uh, signing by the author.